makes a great fight scene great? What separates the true contenders from the also-rans? Tonight, we're taking a look at the best anime brawl of 2023 and an instant frontrunner for greatest of all time to find out. Now, depending on personal taste, that sentence I just said could describe like seven different fights in this last season of JJK, eight depending on how much you like Mecha, and that's not a knock against all the incredible fight work we've also seen in other shows like Undead Unluck, Free Run, One Piece, Bleach, Shangri-La Frontier, and Scott Pilgrim Takes Off this year. Jujutsu Kaisen's just on a whole different level, especially once it gets to Shibuya, where the station becomes a character in itself, which we explore across the whole season as various fights within spill out into its labyrinthine tunnels and the surrounding streets and buildings in tactically and choreographically fascinating ways. All of which was already great in the manga, but is elevated immensely by the endless stream of gorgeous, inventive, musically infused animation that gives each fight its own distinct aesthetic identity. From Gojo flying off the rails literally and figuratively in time with a frenetic jazz beat, to Yuji's intricate, the raid-inspired dance of death with his long-lost big brother, to the two-movement symphony of senseless carnage that Sukuna performs with Jogo and Maharaga, the whole season's basically oops all all timers. But of all those timers, there is one that stands apart by embodying everything I look for in animated action. Which one? Uh, do me a quick favor. Just tap the screen or wiggle your mouse a bit. You see those words up there? Yuji's final showdown with Mahito is a fight for the ages, three years in the making, and it's time we started breaking down exactly what makes it work so well. But first, Tonight's fight coverage is brought to you by Factor. Folks often ask me, Jeff, how do you watch so much anime and still find time to write and record at least an hour of high quality scripted video every month? Well, one of my secrets is kind of just eating like crap, honestly. Less time spent cooking means more time for roasting, after all, and getting fast food delivered is so darn convenient these days. But it's also darn expensive and crazy unhealthy. Luckily, Factors found a better way. They deliver fresh, never-frozen, gourmet chef-prepared meals straight to your door, which you can heat up to eat up in two minutes flat. That's so fast, I can make a meal during the end credits and previews for most shows. I mean, I won't, because, you know, Skipping anime themes is blasphemy, but I could. And let me tell you, having that kind of microwave meal convenience without the microwave meal taste is a game changer. Factor meals aren't just delicious either. They're also nutritious with plenty of good stuff packed into the base meals and plenty more available as sides and add-ons. The whole Factor plan's insanely customizable. You can handpick anywhere between four and 18 meals a week, or if even that's too much hassle, just let Factor craft a plan for you based on your preferences and history. To get more out of your meals and your day, head to factor75.com or click the link in the doobly-doo and use code MB50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. Fresh off the aftermath of the third best fight of the year in which Sukuna used his body to delete nearly 8,000 square meters of prime Shibuya real estate and with it at least several hundred human beings, Yuji, I gotta save everyone I can, Itadori is understandably a wee bit shook. And when he rounds the corner to see his bruised, battered, and fourth degree burned pal and mentor Nanamine getting tag your gibbed by Mahito, that pushes him right to the breaking point. <laughs> Uh, sorry, I think that might be the wrong clip. By the way, Nanami's last stand leading into this is a mini masterpiece in itself, contrasting his hallucinatory dreams of a breezy Malaysian retirement with the brutal weight of his real responsibilities in the here and now to punctuate the tragedy of his passing. But we've got like four episodes of fight to get through, so 
Uh, there's just no time to dwell on that. His last words of encouragement, you've got it from here, heavily implied to be the same last words his old partner Hybara cursed him with before getting off screen, give Yuji something to hang on to and keep him going, but only by a thread, and you can feel that in his voice as he rages at the curse. <laughs> which only makes the villain's retort all the more savage. <laughs> yeah, this right here is what makes Mahito one of the all-time greatest anime villains. It's not the only thing, as we'll soon see his whole character concept is a fight animator's wet dream, but before he starts throwing extremely dangerous hands, Mahito's first line of attack is psychological warfare, using every angle he can think of to get under his foe's skin and into their heads. And even by his standards, man, telling a guy to use his inside voice right after you murder his friend in front of him is the peak of anime villain disrespect. Of course, Yuji instantly flies into a blind rage and rushes him head on, and of course, Mahito immediately capitalizes on that lapse in judgment, throwing up a transfigured human wall to buy enough time to smash a bunch of souls together into a big mouth snake guy thing and set up the most hilariously convoluted sucker punch ever. <laughs> Though the really funny thing is, the curse didn't even need to bring that psychological A-game. The wall of semi-conscious man-meat reflexively begging Yuji to save it is enough to make him pull his punch by itself, even though he already cleared that mental hurdle the last time he and Nanami fought Mahito together. The burden of losing his mentor, coupled with the shame and guilt of what his body has done, even if Sukuna actually did it, is so heavy it causes Yuji to regress, and this is conveyed to the viewer without exposition entirely through the contrast between the two fights. That's far from the only moment of show-don't-tell brilliance we'll see tonight, but in this initial clash, at least, the real brilliance lies in what we don't see. Mahito actually stabbed Yuji in the face just then, and does it again with the full momentum of the worm train teeth thing behind his attack. But thanks to the camera angles and speed of the cuts emulating Yuji's perspective, we don't get a clear look at the blade until most of it's already broken off on his extremely thick skull, which is as good a cue as any to break briefly for the traditional pre-fight banter they both so hastily skipped over. Employing some very literal hand puppetry, Mahito shows rather than tells Yuji exactly how they're not so different, him and he. The curse seeks to kill, the sorcerer to save, but fundamentally they both choose who lives and dies on impulse for their own satisfaction. They're both driven by emotion over rational thought, and they've both killed people with rich inner lives kind of just because. In a more cliched fight, Yuji would ultimately triumph by proving this inhumanly human villain wrong, but here Mahito speaks some uncomfortable truths. Yuji's only path to victory lies in accepting that he, like all Jujutsu users, is not a hero, but a killer, and giving in to that most basic of instincts in order to kill before he is killed. Of course, the jab at his dead friend is also meant to rile Itadori up again and make him make another mistake, but all the blood dripping from our not a hero's head seems to have cooled it a bit, and from this point forward, his rage will be cold and focused like Nanami's, not hot and wild. As the walls start closing in, he's ready to turn the tables and dismantle his foe in a primo slice of classic fight and tight hallway action. Here, Mahito's attacks become blatantly telegraphed, while Yuji starts throwing out those blows we don't see coming until well after they've arrived. Now, it's the curse who's blinded, not by rage, but arrogance, and the shift in the tempo of the editing matches that change. No matter how many tricks he pulls and sucker punches he throws, Mahito will never be able to beat a clear-headed Yuji in a close quarters hand-to-hand -hand fight. <laughs> Ugh! <laughs> 
and he can't crush him to death with a big wall of meat, neither, though that move does at least afford the opportunity to move back to the more open parts of the station, where his power to transform limbs and create horrific chimera soldiers like some sort of evil Edward Elric, plus stretch all about like some sort of evil monkey D. Luffy, gives him a zoning advantage over Yuji's power to punch you right in the soul. But Yuji quickly drags the fight back onto his turf by escaping into a tight elevator shaft, and while he doesn't land quite as many clean blows in there compared to the meat hallway, the tempo of the editing is clearly back on his side. Three separate times heading down then up that shaft, we see Mahito go in for a killing blow, only to whiff on an empty frame, then cut to a shot of Yuji already well out of the way and poised to strike back, emphasizing his speed by not animating him getting to that point. And even when they exit the elevator, though Mahito does so in marvelous style, that pattern continues. Yuji deflects his bullet with casual ease, dodges the follow-up before it even hits, and pops a hole in his oversized hand when he tries to smack him down on the stairs. So the villain shifts to more defensive guerrilla tactics, using some bystanders to score both an ambush and some bonus emotional damage on Yuji's increasingly fragile savior complex. And he has an even more devastating secret weapon hidden in his back pocket. In a quick flashback, we learn that right after Dagon helped him stock up on human corpses and honestly, just the most adorable way possible, Mahito split himself in two to have a better chance of finding Yuji before Jogo and Choso could. And that second half is presently standing in Shibuya's iconic Dogenzaka Alley, staring down a very mean-looking Nobara Kugisaki, whose corpse would, of course, make the perfect cherry to top the mind-break cake he's trying to bake for Yuji. He quickly finds that's easier said than done, though. Not only is Nobara's inside insult game better than his, to the point she genuinely pisses him off a bit, but she's also a trickster who excels in ranged combat, and low-key she's better than him at that, too. She lands a direct hit on the doppelganger's head without giving him a chance to move his soul out of the way first, something very few sorcerers of any grade could manage. Though, as the first episode of the fight ends, he does remain confident she won't be able to seriously hurt him because she can't directly hit that soul. The next episode picks up by cutting back to the main Mahito, harvesting more humans to use as weapons against Yuji. The poor heroic sap just can't convince himself that they're already beyond saving, and as he's blinded by a blood bomb that he really should have seen coming, the curse readies yet another killing blow. Back in the alley, as the nail that just missed him falls to the floor, the clone runs around on the rooftops trying to attack Nobara from her blind spots. Since they're both ranged fighters out in the open, the animators are able to really amp up the scale of destruction here and work in some really fun dynamic sakuga. The bulk of this brawl was handled by key animator Yuto, who infuses the action with a distinctly Gynax-esque energy. At first, the clone does seem to have the upper hand, which happens to be made of knives, as he makes playful use of his Luffy Elric power set to wear her down, but the fact that he slashes rather than tags her tells her he can't use his curse technique, and a counterattack with her scattered nails gives her an opening to close in and use hers, which, as it turns out, does its this whole remote attack thing by directly targeting the enemy's soul. <laughs> Realizing that he's gravely miscalculated and about to be the victim of JJK's first ever remote control jumping, the clone beats a tactical retreat like the little bitch he is, and not realizing she's about to fall for essentially the same gambit that that other little bitch with the autonomous hand sword used on her, Nobara gives chase toward the station, down to the platforms, and right into the waiting hands of the real Mahito, whom Itadori is just too late to warn her about. Though he is able to at least one-shot the gloating clone in the aftermath, keeping the tables 
kind of even. Nobara launches into a lengthy, sad flashback, the JJK character equivalent of declaring they're both one week from retirement and their wedding with a baby on the way tomorrow, reflecting on all the horrible, cruel, loud people who made her small town childhood hell, plus the quietly kind folk who helped her get through it and keep supporting her to this day. And when it's all over, she concludes that life wasn't so bad after all. Then her entire optic nerve explodes. I think most JJK fans would agree that this moment is the fight's one real weak point, at least if you count it as one contiguous fight and not two fights that split when Nobara gets taken out, uh, which a lot of people do, and I guess I could have done that and saved a lot of time, but I didn't. Now, I don't think it's a bad story beat per se, the flashback's self-contained plot is quite poignant, and the final symbolism of Kugisaki surrounded by all the seats she has open in her heart hits really damn hard. I definitely wouldn't say that Gege fridged her, which is a whole other can of worms that Yazzie and I will talk about on the podcast so this video doesn't get twice as long, but Compared to the perfection that precedes and especially follows, it's undeniably a bit undercooked. No matter how artfully it's presented, you can tell we're only getting her backstory now because Gege didn't bother to establish it earlier, and that kind of makes the end of her arc feel abrupt and incomplete. Though that's also precisely what makes it so tragic, and the next, much shorter flashback to a random funny moment of the pals goofing around after Nobara a trashed Gojo's $2,000 shirt, hits Yuji like a whole ass freight train, obliterating the last wall that had been holding back his guilt and pain, and with it, his entire justification for his own existence. I mean, if he can't even save his closest friends, what's the point of carrying on with a monster like Sukuna inside him? He may as well just let Mahito kill him right now. And the curse is way, way, way more than happy to oblige. <laughs> With his first black flash, Mahito enters the zone, immediately comboing from his super into a tech grab as he starts laying into Yuji literally and figuratively. <laughs> Again, there is a lot of truth in the villain's mad ranting. You can only defeat the most vile part of humanity with the power of incredible violence. But he also mixes in some very telling lies. Namely, that he'll eventually forget Yuji, just like all the other humans he's killed. You never forget your first shonen rival. Luckily, before Mahito can find that out the hard way, the most magnificent man in manga or anime arrives to save the day. Ali Toto immediately asserts his 530,000 IQ by paraphrasing a 700 year old poem from the tale of the Heike, one of Japan's foundational historical epics about the inevitable fall of even the mightiest dynasties, all to declare that he and Yuji are simply built different. As charismatic mic drops go, it's second to exactly one, also Toto's which we'll get to. Before we do, though, viewers with even 1% of that IQ might have noticed an issue with how he saved Yuji just then, since the kid doesn't actually swap with anything when he's teleported away from Mahito. This is clearly a storyboarding error, probably brought on by the series' infamously intense production crunch during this last season. The original manga has Toto swap Mahito with himself, while Yuji doesn't move at all. Now, this isn't a hard error to fix, just draw a rock falling where Yuji used to be for the Blu-ray and it'll at least be consistent with Toto's power set, but that would still be a deviation from his typical battle plan, which, as we saw when they fought Hanami, is to pretend that Boogie Woogie has way more limitations than it actually does. <laughs> Hey! 
Now, this is kind of a moot point since A, Mahito already heard most of how Boogie Woogie works from Hanami, and B, even if he hadn't, he's so dangerous he forces Toto to swap him with both Yuji and Nita the first time he attacks, so that's that cat out of the bag. But he doesn't find out that Toto can swap objects too for another 10 minutes, so even fixing it that way would still leave a small plot hole. Very small, since Mahito sees through that object fake out right away and anyway, but still a hole. Not that any of this takes away anything from how absolutely glorious the animation in these episodes is overall, or makes the fight even one iota less enjoyable to watch. Boogie Woogie's so fun, even Mahito enjoys having it used on him. It's just, you know, something I noticed, and pointing it out helps to establish my nitpicking credibility so that when I talk about the bit everyone thinks is an animation error, where Mahito almost touches Toto while both his hands are occupied and he escapes by seemingly clapping his cheeks, you'll all take it seriously when I say y'all missed the point. This is another example of that editing trick we saw at the start of the fight, where the losing fighter doesn't see what's happening until after it's already happened. Happened. There are exactly three frames in that attack where we can't see Toto's hands anymore, and in those frames he manages to yank the sword out of Mahito's grip and clap to swap with it. He's just that fast. I should really stop getting ahead of myself to glaze up Toto's incredible intellect and physical prowess, though, because I really should be glazing up his incredible qualities as a healthy masculine role model. Toto famously believes the only greater sin than letting oneself be weak is letting oneself be boring. Not a take one typically hears from men with a lot of emotional intelligence, however, as a real man, Toto understands all too well that there is a difference between weakness and vulnerability. So when his best friend and brother breaks down in front of him, saying he can't forgive himself or bring himself to fight anymore, Toto listens and chooses his next words with utmost care and respect for those feelings. He reminds Yuji that as Jujutsu Sorcerers, his fallen comrades will never truly be defeated as long as he is there to carry on their will. And while it doesn't invalidate the weight of his sins that he feels bearing down on him, the weight of the responsibility to carry that on is far greater. So Yuji must keep going. Toto then leaves him to think on that advice, plus a sliver of hope that Nita gives him that Nobara might maybe possibly not be so dead that Shoko the healer can't save her, and heads off to trade some of the most gorgeous Sakuga we've seen so far with the villain. Both his claps and Mahito's squeals of evil glee fall into sync with the background music, along with the animation, as the curse tries every trick he can imagine to get his hands on Toto, and absolutely none of them work. <laughs> Toto may not be able to hit his soul directly, but with that taunt, he scores a direct hit on the most playful, competitive part of it, and Mahito shifts his killing intent from the kid on the floor to the kid who's protecting him with such incredible skill. And right then, right when he's written Yuji off and fully committed his mind to outwitting the next swap, Toto tags Itadori back in, showing utmost trust in his brother's emotional resilience. And Yuji pays that back in spades by channeling the pain of losing Nanami into a perfectly timed Black Flash. <laughs> Yuji and Toto have one of the absolute best platonic male friendships in all of anime, which one shouldn't confuse with blatant yaoi bait, especially not in Jujutsu Kaisen since, you know, it does both. The rest of the episode, minus the part where Mekamaru tells all of Toto's boring classmates that they shouldn't go to Shibuya because they're way too boring to survive the current level of power creep, is a gloriously violent celebration of that friendship. Together, they dismantle every tactic the curse can throw at them with ease, fighting in such perfect sync with each other and the music that not even two Mahitos can keep up. Their combined power also amps up the scale of animated destruction, opening up the rest of the station to be part of the arena by, you know, letting them punch through all those 
walls and floors in the way of fighting there, which gives the effects artists a chance to really flex, and they're not the only ones. All the goofy squashing and stretching that Mahito does as he zips around the duo and attacks them really highlights what makes his design and power set such an animator's wet dream. Like, just look at all these goofy little faces he gets to make. Eventually, he does tire of having his ass kicked all over Shibuya Station and tries to split the brothers up with another one of them midnight meat trains, but even after after doing that, he still can't lay a finger or sword on Toto, and it takes the brothers less than a minute to reunite. When they do, Toto hands Yuji a bit of rubble, and he instantly knows what to do with it, charging it with cursed energy and throwing it as fast as he can so that Toto can swap with it and carry that momentum into the single most epic black flash in the entire series. Fueled by his love for Yuji, tall idol Takata Tan, and tall girls with big butts everywhere. It doesn't do any damage, of course, Toto can't hit him in the soul, but it does mean that all three of them are now in the zone as Mahito unleashes an astoundingly animated flood of freaky teeth worm things to bring the fight up to the surface and paint the town Necronomicon. <laughs> That is, in fact, Mahito's plan, to use the extra space outside to create some real chaos and give him and Itadori some distance from Toto, but boy, do they make him work for it, and with him, the animators. This shot by Takahiro Watabe of Mahito's severed head bouncing away and growing these adorable little legs while his main body sprouts equally adorable cartoon bug eyes and turns into a Phyllis Diller spray and play might just be my favorite bit of animation in this entire fight if not the whole series so far. Though, admittedly, at least 50% of the appeal is all the extremely moe mahito noises, and that goes for a lot of great moments in this fight, and the entire season at large, for that matter. In the time he buys with this ploy, the curse manages to stitch together a handful of weaker souls into a new, beefier kind of transmuted human, the polymorphic soul isomer, which he immediately sends to attack the brothers. Toto just as immediately concocts a 530k IQ counter, though, swapping himself with the creature the instant before a Phyllis Diller hose would have taken his head off in another extremely impressive Sakuga shot by Shoto Go. Shozono, where the camera follows Toto through the swap while moving in 3D. This move also conveniently gives Aoi a much wider view of the battlefield and a chance to strategize. Reasoning that the head must be Mahito since he used Idol Transfiguration, Toto swaps it in with the much stronger clone body that he and Itadori were fighting. But while he's focused on doing that, he makes one grave miscalculation based on old information from Yuji and Mr. Naname that transfigured humans are all on the level of lower grade cursed spirits. The soul isomer catches him off guard with two very hard hitting punches, the first rattling his brain, the second sending him flying through a department store and into the next block over. Plus, as a bonus for Mahito, Yuji gets distracted worrying about his friend and loses the initiative that Toto's last swap bought him. One swap after that is all it takes for Toto to discover that the soul isomers are, in essence, glass cannons, but with two more left to take out, it'll still take him a minute to get back to Yuji, and in that time, Mahito throws everything he's got left at the kid. A torrent of transfigured monsters sends him flying into the sky above Shibuya Scramble and smashing into the surrounding buildings, which puts our boy in a pretty tricky position. Though even here, Mahito does forget the all-important fighting wisdom that you should never give your enemy a weapon, like the entire 109 sign. 
If you lack the cultural context to understand just how raw that last shot was, imagine if in Independence Day, Will Smith killed some aliens by throwing the Empire State Building at them. Unfortunately, even that show of badassery isn't enough to stop the villain from catching Yuji's dropkick and ragdolling him into Shibuya's new Sukuna district, though at least in a lucky break, he doesn't land on any body parts he actually needs. And much to Mahito's annoyance, Toto's already waiting there for them, having taken no additional damage from the two soul isomers because, again, he's just that good. For all Mahito's trickery, he was only able to land all of two hits on the guy, even if they were pretty clean hits. But he's got one last trick up his sleeve that Toto can't possibly see coming, not even with his six-digit IQ, because it should be physically impossible. <laughs> By combining the activation of his cursed technique with the expansion of his barrier and domain, the same way Gojo kicked all his friends' asses down in the subway, Mahito is able to get Toto with the guaranteed hit before he can defend himself with a simple domain and before Sukuna can punish the curse for touching his soul. It's one of the most impressive acts of Jujutsu mastery we've seen in the series so far, and even that's only enough to take out one one of Toto's arms. Still, that is just enough to cripple his tricky curse technique and distract Yuji once more for good measure, allowing the curse to move in for the killing blow, which Toto simply tanks by instantly calculating exactly where he needs to concentrate all his cursed energy to save his organs. And while normally Mahito could just kill him with his cursed technique instead of a black flash, he made one fatal error by breaking off Toto's locket with all that arm shrapnel, thus unleashing his inner Tanaka ton. <laughs> Hone Hone Hone, the 16-year-old animation genius who came up with this incredible anime original Toto moment, ended up apologizing for it when he realized he'd inadvertently offended some religious bigots with the cross-dressing, so I'd just like to balance the scales by saying thank you, Hone Hone Hone, for your incredible contribution to human culture. Please never apologize for anything like this ever again, because it is awesome, and so are you. Back in the real world, in his second-to-last 530,000 IQ move, Toto claps the only hand that's handy to tag Yuji back in for another Black Flash, sacrificing what's left of his cursed technique to land what should have been a decisive blow. However, just when it seemed like Mahito's sleeve was all out of tricks, he discovered a whole new sleeve in that moment of epiphany brought on by his Black Flash, his true final form. Now, while that transformation sequence was like an 11 out of 10, the form itself is eh, 6 at best. It kind of just looks like Hanami f the virus type Digimon, you know? But the way that Mahito uses it elevates it back up to a 9. Every bit of the form, from the tail to the elbow blades to the non-vestigial ninja headband, is used to full effect in this last, most brutal fist fight with Yuji. Those blades in particular do some real damage, tearing a deep gash in Itadori's shoulder and slicing his whole ass cheek open. I mean, his whole face cheek, not... I was using an idiom you get it. Which has got to be one of the most painful looking bits of battle damage I have ever seen animated in shonen, seinen, anything. This is the sort of mutilation that character designers inflict on zombies to make them look more savage and predatory, and it kind of ends up having the same effect on Yuji here, turning his mouth into an almost 
wolf-like snarl. And despite tanking that injury and several stories worth of pavement as Mahito blitzes him, Yuji remains steadfast in his murderous focus and steady on his feet. Well, okay, one foot does shake just a bit, but even in his new form, Mahito hasn't fully shaken off the damage from that last black flash yet, and that buys Yuji the time to pound his frayed nerves back into compliance. They're both clearly on their last legs here, but paradoxically, they're both fighting at peak capacity, fueled by raw adrenaline and even rawer hatred. And just as Mahito surpassed the theoretical limits of domain expansion moments ago, Yuji's about to break the one rule of Black Flash by performing it at will with all of his remaining cursed energy behind it. That's not the first impossibility we've seen in this fight, of course, so Mahito remains very wary of it as he makes his approach, knowing it'll only take one more solid hit to end him. He's quite clever in how he works around it, too, removing the rock-hard armor of his new form at the moment of impact to throw Yuji's timing subtly off. But Yuji's even cleverer still in his own dumb way, using that altered timing to his advantage by changing the punch to a divergent fist at the last second, so the time-lagged cursed energy hit throws off Mahito's counter and leaves him open for another flash. So you might be wondering how they're both so sure that's gonna hit. Like, what technique is Yuji using to overcome the normal limits of cursed energy manipulation and do this seemingly impossible thing? The moment doesn't actually need an explanation for this, it just feels dramatically appropriate, but one does exist if you're curious. You just won't find it in the pages of Jujutsu Kaisen, because that pose that Yuji's doing to charge up each hit, where he cups his right fist in his left palm to concentrate as much of his cursed energy as possible on a single fixed point, is the same pose Gon Freaks strikes before throwing out his signature Jajangken Rock Punch in Hunter x Hunter. And this isn't just a random reference. We know for a fact that Yuji is an avid shonen jump reader. What he's doing here is applying what he knows about one of his favorite manga's power systems to cursed energy and just kind of hoping it'll work. And it will if Mahito actually lets him land that hit. Lucky for Yuji, he's not the only guy here with base taste. <laughs> Yes, Toto ends the fight exactly as he began it, by quoting classic Japanese literature. In this case, he's paraphrasing Netero's revelation that he can use his Nen one-handed in his final fight with the Chimera Ant King, using the inherent dramatic energy of that moment to fuel the perfect bluff. One so dramatically convincing that the frazzled curse reacts without thinking, opening himself up to a devastating finisher on his still exposed left side. Also, Toto throws in a Fist of the North Star reference just for style points. The Hunter Hunter references are anything but style over substance, though. They're at once a tribute to the mangaka who so clearly had the greatest influence on the plot structure of Shibuya, the culmination of a friendship that started with Toto hallucinating himself reading Jump with Yuji, and the realization of every Jump fan everywhere's long-held secret fantasy of saving the world, specifically using the skills that we gained by reading way too much manga. And it's all delivered without a single fourth wall break in a manner entirely consistent with the characters, the existing world, and the story. This is absolutely masterful writing, and honestly the whole reason I wanted to make this video in the first place. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love me some Mahito. He's one of the most memorable villains in all of Shonen, and he's still got some very satisfying noises left to make. Uh... But man, I 
love Aoi Todo, and this fight encapsulates everything that makes him and Yuji probably my all-time favorite fighting duo. All the compound trauma leading up to that moment also transforms Yuji in a fundamental way, though, putting a cold-blooded edge on his kind-hearted demeanor, finally accepting that killing is killing, no matter how he tries to justify it, and the world isn't gonna give him any greater, more moral purpose than just killing as many curses as he can. He accepts his role as an apex predator, forcing Mahito into its proper role as a pathetic, frightened prey animal. Yuji takes no joy in killing the thing, only pausing for a moment to watch it suffer, which the stupid creature stupidly ends prematurely by pressing a spiteful little pebble into the mud balls it's flinging at him and reminding him exactly why it needs to die. For all its magnificent bastardry up to now, the way the curse goes out makes Frieza's death look downright dignified. Though, much like Goku with Frieza, Yuji is still robbed of the final satisfaction of delivering that killing blow when the body, formerly known as Suguru Geto, shows up to throw the fully evolved low HP cursed spirit in one of his edible Pokeballs. But that leads into a whole new conflict that the sponsor definitely ain't paying me to cover, so all I have left to say is one last thank you to Factor for their support, an additional thank you to you for listening to this lengthy stealth sermon about the unrivaled majesty of Aoi Toto, and also some stuff about fights, I guess. And, of course, that I'm Jeff Thu, professional anime ring announcer, bidding you a good night and great fights.